Um, it's 2023. My name is Doug Griffin. This is my Sunday school lesson. I just give that intro in case somebody's tuning in for the first time. Uh, we are studying the book of Leviticus. I'm just going through the whole Bible on Sundays. We did Genesis, Exodus, now we're in Leviticus. We'll do Numbers, Deuteronomy. We'll just go through because I believe it's just easier to understand what the scriptures are saying in context. Um, next Sunday is my church concert where we are, it's called, uh, it's, uh, God is doing a great work. And the, the, it's also a fundraiser because we're converting our church kitchen into a commercial kitchen, which is a huge undertaking. But there's a law that in order to serve the public, they want you to use a commercial kitchen. So we want to continue to feed the homeless. We were doing that. We stopped when COVID happened in 2020. It's been three years now. We want to get back to, because we've been doing it for like 30 years at my church. And we want to get back to it. And so we are, we've raised the majority of the funds. So we have decided to get going and just believe God for the rest of the money will come on, come in. Now we're in the book of Leviticus. Uh, chapter 6, we've learned about five different offerings, the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering. Those first three offerings um, are just free will offerings, just kind of highlighting our relationship with God. Bring an offering um, to me to, to just for fellowship, the, the grain, the, I'm going to go backwards, the peace offering, which is number three, is is celebrating our fellowship with God. It's the, it's the type of offering you'd have if you invited someone to your house. You, you got to eat the peace offering. Um, and it's like you're having dinner with God. The grain offering is you're celebrating the works of your hands that God has provided. God provided the grain and that you and you work together with him. He's where the provision comes for. But God has blessed the works of your hands. So you're not saying, look what I did. But you're saying, look what you did through me. The burnt offering is, is a general offering that the war between God and man is over. Not as a war, but the separation. The separation between God and man is over. And uh, that's the first offering you want to start with. Acknowledging that we're sinners in general, but that God has made a way for us to be at peace with him, to have fellowship with him, to for him to hear our prayers, etc. So you always start with a burnt offering. I'm just thinking, I just, Jesus' prayer flashed, flashed through my mind, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will. Be. We start off by saying, acknowledging you and your holiness and that your kingdom and your work being done. So the, the burnt offering begins with our gratefulness that God has, through his mercy, provided a way for us to uh, praise him and to be in contact with him. So the next two offerings were the sin offering and the trespass or the guilt offering. And those involved sp specific sins. So the first offering, the burnt offering, is just saying, in general, I'm a sinner, and I am just grateful for God's mercy. Now, if there's specific sins you know about, uh, you did something crazy. You got drunk last night. I'm just making that up, you know. Uh, then then you're, the sin offering and the trespass often kind of go together. One is acknowledging the thought, basically. And the second one is acknowledging the action. And he wants to separate those two so that we understand that it begins with the thought. It begins with, uh, it, it's not just the external, there's an internal. That he's trying to teach the Hebrew people that there's, we have an internal part because we're only, we only ever see the external. And, but he's trying to say the, it begins in the heart. 
and then there's an action. So he wants to teach us to separate those things. Now, uh, in Leviticus 6, there are, I call it the three laws. Leviticus 6, the three laws. He's, um, he's giving instruction on how the burnt offering should come to him to, for the priest, how the grain offering should come to him, and how the sin offering should be handled. There's, there's three things he wants us to be aware of. Well, I'll read it instead of just telling you what the three things are. Well, I'll just read it. Okay, so in Leviticus chapter 6, starting with verse 8, because I did the first seven verses last week. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the birth offering. So there's three laws. There's the law of the burnt offering, the law of the grain offering, the law of the sin offering. So there's three things you have to be, want to be aware of. And this is as far as the priests are concerned. It says, the burnt offering shall be on the hearth, upon the altar. So there's an, um, just reminding us that the altar is outside of the tabernacle. Everyone, anyone could come into where the altar was. Only the priests were able to go to the tabernacle. So the altar is something that everybody could see and have contact with. And there's a hearth a fireplace underneath the altar. He says, the burnt offering shall be on the hearth upon the altar all night until morning. So there was two times the altar, the offering was in the morning. There's a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. And he's saying here that the burnt offering should come in the morning and the night. It should burn all more. The first offering should burn all day. And the second offering, which came at night, should burn all night until morning. He wants it to be continued. It says, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. So the fire must continue to be going. You've got to do it because this is something that God wants us to not just only have a morning relationship with God. Oh, I talked with God this morning, which is lovely. I spoke with God this morning and, uh, and I started my day. Hey, hey T Tammy and Tony and Marilyn and Joey. I... I, I spoke with God this morning, and now I can forget him the rest of the day. He's like, no, I want you to think that I'm your God all day long, morning and night, morning and night. So this burn offering, which is your entree into the world, your acknowledgement of how much we need God. It's not ever addressing specific sins, just the fact that in general, God created the heavens and earth, and we need him, and he's in control, and we're not in control. That's in the morning and at night. Um, in the old days, it'd be say your prayers before you get into bed. Pray in the morning, say your prayers before you get you know, so that you're, you're recognizing it's an all day thing. Um, the, the Israelite, the Hebrews, children, people got in trouble because they kind of started to short circuit these offerings. They, which is what we do. We don't like to, uh, we, we like to cut things short after a while. Eh, we can just give that 15 minutes. We have to give that a whole hour. And eh, we don't need to do it in the morning and evening. We'll do something else uh, at the, in the evening. We did it in the morning. That's enough. So he says, this should be a law. This is the law of the burnt offering. It will be on the hearth, on the altar all night. I know you bring it in the morning, but it's got to be there all night too until morning. And it's fire can't be put out. In Second Kings... We get a glimpse of how the offerings are going. It says, Second uh, Kings chapter sixteen, verse fifteen says, "Then King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, so the king of the Jew, in Judah, he's he's commanding Uriah the priest, saying, on the great altar, burn the morning offering, the morning burnt offering, and then the evening grain offering. It's like, I thought it was supposed to be an evening burnt offering, nah." Burnt offerings enough in the morning. In the evening, grain offering, he says the king's burnt sacrifice and his grain offering with, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering and their drink offerings and sprinkle on it all the blood of the burnt offering. Just put the blood of the burnt offering on the rest of it and, and you make it holy. And all the blood of the sacrifice and the bronze altar, offer, altar shall be for me to inquire by. And then I'll be able to go to the Lord and, and get some answers. Uh, 
So even though it's a law, like I need you to do this. And it, again, it's their law for them. God is training the Hebrew people who are the only people that are hearing the voice of God on earth. On earth, the Hebrews are the only people on earth who are listening to God and worshiping the only true God. Every other culture is worshiping an idol that they've created. So they are easily influenced by all these other cultures because they're the only ones. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you were the only one. It's very easy to be influenced by everybody else. So God was very strict on them. That is not the condition today. There are people who know the true and living God all over the world. We are not the only ones. But at that point, they were. So he says, you got to do this exactly as I tell you because it's too easy for you to fall into other habits to see all the other cultures and what they're doing. So this is a law. Do not vary from this. But of course, they did. And they're about to go into captivity because of it, because you just get into certain habits. You just They just didn't listen to God as much, started doing other things. And certain things you just have to do because if you just let them go, They'll just go. Uh, that's just human nature. So, and think, well, 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 they did an offering, in a, but the burnt offering, which represented their coming to God and acknowledging Him as their Savior, they only did it in the morning. And then they did the other offerings when they felt like it, and we'll just sprinkle some of the blood from the burnt offering on them, and that'll be enough. And to think, even though God said it's a law, I know God said it, but <laughs> they end up going to captivity, they end up being captured by Babylon because they're now susceptible to these other nations. They're not listening to God anymore as much as they used to. In Nehemiah, once they came back from captivity, so um, this is three, 400 years later. First, the northern were captured by the Assyrians, and then the uh, southern tribes were captured by the Babylonians. And so once they came back, um, Nehemiah, who's not a priest or a king or anything like that, is reading to them. Uh, so Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square. So around 700, the north is captured, around 580, southern is captured. They're finally freed in around the early 400s, and they're finally back. Okay. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. Not the Watergate Hotel, just a literal Watergate. Although the Watergate Hotel is named after, well, okay. So, in front of the Watergate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses. Nehemiah is a general, Ezra is just a scribe. No priest, no king. Bring the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. You know what? Let's read Leviticus. Let's read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Romans. Bring those books. Let's read them. Haven't read them in a long time. Three, four hundred years. Forgot what they said. So bring the law of Moses before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. So the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah, which leads to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. On the mountain, when Moses brought down... Um, like the, the second set of Ten Commandments, because he broke the first because he got mad. There was a Feast of Trumpets on Rosh Hashanah, and then there was the Day of Atonement where they repented for how they built idols. And so this Rosh Hashanah leading to Yom Kippur, is, they're celebrating that at least. And, you know, we're about to atone for our sins. So, you know what, we should bring that Book of the Law down and just see what it says. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Some 6 a.m. until at least 12, about six, seven hours. Before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And they said, uh-oh, we're not doing any of the stuff that we were supposed to have been doing. We better change. So they reinstated this burnt offering in the morning and in the evening. They reinstated it. But they hadn't done it for a while. And God said, this is a law. Because I, I want there to be constant fire going, and I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, so in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 10, just give me verse 10. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. That means underwear. 
and and she, he shall put on his body and take up the ashes of the burnt offering because the burnt the 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 stake has been burning there all day. The lamb chops have been burning all day, so it's ash now. Which the fire has consumed in the altar. And he shall put them beside the altar. So scrape off the ashes because you want to put on new meat the next day. Then he shall take off his garments. So you don't you, you got to put on your holy garments in order to handle the offering. But once it's off the altar, you're going to dispose of them. So now you got to put on different garments because now you're going to walk through the camp because people are camped all around the tabernacle and you're going to go out outside the camp and dispose of these ashes and you can't do that in your holy garments he says to carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place in ezekiel chapter 44 verse 19 it goes a little bit more detail about this about the priest ezekiel chapter 44 verse 19 this is about 700 years later after the law was written. They shall have linen turbans on their head and linen trousers on their bodies and they shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. So all just be in linen. When they go out to the outer court, to the outer court of the people, they shall take off their garments in which they have ministered and leave them in the holy chambers and put on other garments. And in their holy garments, they shall not sanctify the people. If they are to, if the holy garments were for only for the things in the temple that were holy. If I come out in my holy garments and you drop a quarter and I pick it up, well, it's now holy because I'm in my holy garment and I've sanctified it. So now I've got to go back into the temple. Anything that you that I touch, if I'm wearing my holy garment, now belongs in the temple. So it says, take off your holy garments. Plus, it also makes the holy thing common. God is trying to separate the holy from the profane, the holy from the secular. He's trying to understand there are there's such a thing as holy, such a thing as secular. They should not mix. Some churches get in trouble for mixing stuff too much. It's okay to modernize, but it's not okay to take the things of the world that are really worldly and mix them with holy things as though they're the same thing. They're not. So like we gotta separate these things. Um, Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12 and the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it it shall not be put out and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burn offering in order in it on it and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings but it also happens on the altar and a fire shall always be burning on the altar it shall never go out why because he wants to give them a visual symbol that God is always present, and we're always supposed to have our relationship with him. We're supposed to be talking to him all day long. Hey, Lord, help me. I'm lost. I need your help. Uh, as you're driving down the street, oh, okay, Jesus, help me with it. Like a constant, but in Hebrew, the author in Hebrew says that we go to our high priest, Jesus, whoever lives to make intercession for us. He's always praying for us. He's always interceding for us. They, he wanted to give them the visual that they were pre, the priest had shifts. That there's a morning priest and there's evening priest, but there's always some priest who's stoking the fire for you. There's always some priest who's keeping that fire burning for you. Always. So that we would have that image, like God doesn't sleep, God doesn't... And we say that, but we don't really believe it. We think there are times that God's taking a break or something. And, oh Lord, did you see what just happened? And like, as well, God's going, what? Uh-oh, I'm sorry I missed that. I was watching Gilligan's Island. He's ever living to make intercession for us he's always watching over he's that priest that's still in the fire all the time so he's trying to give them that image that that's who god is there's not a time of day when god is listening at a time when well you know god doesn't have office hours is what i'm trying to say okay so uh but here's another reason that they're to keep that fire going it's because they never started the fire oh that sounds like a song we didn't start the fire they didn't start the fire in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23, which we'll get to, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. So they went inside the tent, they blessed the people, they came out, because Moses and Aaron were the first priests. Moses and Aaron are both Levites. Uh, then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and a fire came out from before the Lord. So fire came out from this cloud and consumed the burnt offering. <laughs> And right, so there's fire on the altar. 
and the fat on the altar. It, it, it consumes the offering, the flesh, and the fat. Because, you know, you have to take the fat out. Okay. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces because God sent the fire. That's the fire there to keep going. It came from God. Don't let that fire came out. That fire that came from God. Got to keep going. Got to keep going. Got to keep going. The law of the grain offering. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 14. This is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it on the altar before the Lord. So you, you were supposed to take of the works of your hands that God has blessed, bring it, you hand it all to the priest, and the priests are the ones that go to the altar for you. Okay. I'm skipping to Leviticus chapter 6, verse 18. All the males among the children of Aaron may eat it. So the priest, there was a portion that the priest took and put on the altar, representing the, the person who brought it, and the rest, which was a bunch of pancakes, you can eat it. He's saying any of the, any of the priests can eat the, the, the grain offering. Only certain priests could eat, eat the sin offering, or which we're supposed to eat, and, and, and the, uh, certain offerings, only the high priests were, but any of the priests could eat this. Um, it shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings made by fire to the Lord, but everyone who touches them, though, must be holy. So the fire must keep going. Fire can never go out. Second law, everyone who touches must be sanctified, must be holy. Because once God has sanctified something for himself, it's been given to the Lord, then it's God's now, and you're not to profane it uh, by taking it back or just thinking, oh, anybody can touch this. Nope. It says, and you, Joshua 6, I didn't tell you where I was. Joshua 6, verse 18. They've just um, brought down the walls of Jericho. They finally crossed over into the promised land. The walls of Jericho have come tumbling down. Joshua 6, 18. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things. So when you go into their city and you see idols and stuff, don't touch those. And make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Don't touch stuff I said don't touch. And stuff that belongs to me, belongs to me. Verse 19, but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron that you find there are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Those things are now consecrated and only the priests are to touch those things. Because I'm trying to separate, I'm trying to say there are things that belong to God and things belong to the world. I'm trying to teach you the difference. No other culture had a difference. He's trying to teach this to the Hebrew children. We understand that, like, some of it seems simple. Well, yeah, but, but no. So, like, try not to use your Bible as a doorstop. Okay. Then it shall be, Joshua chapter 17, Joshua chapter 7, verse 15. Then it shall be that he who was taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. I'm just reading that. If you touch the accursed thing, you'll be in trouble. If you touch the thing that's been given to God, you'll be in trouble. Okay, so first law, the fire's got to keep going. Second law, you have to be holy to touch any of this stuff. Uh, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 19. And we're on, oh, two-thirds of the way through. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they shall bring, which shall they offer to the Lord, beginning in the day when he is anointed. Now, the grain offering had a different formula when it was just a regular person. Here's the offering that when the when the, the grain offering that is offered when one of the priests is anointing has to be slightly different. They have a different calling on them. So they both give grain offerings, but there's a different calling on the priest. It's got to be one-tenth of an ephah of flour, of the fine flour as a daily grain offering, and half of it in the morning and half of it at night. He gives them a different formula. It doesn't matter what the formula is. It's just that it's different to imply you have a different calling. Verse 23, for every grain offering for the priest shall be wholly burned, and it shall not be eaten. So you can eat of the offering that other people give, but the offering for the priests... 
got to burn the whole thing because I own all of him 24 hours a day. The grain offering you're giving to the Lord, you dedicate your time to the Lord, whatever you choose, and the rest of the day is yours. You acknowledge that God exists. And you don't have to work in the temple all day. The priest is 24 hours a day for you. So we're burning the whole grain offering as symbolically, I own all of you, all of your time. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, just to remind us of the original formula. He says, he shall bring it to Aaron and his, and his sons. When the, a regular person, the laity, when they bring their offering to the son, it says, the priest, one of whom who shall take from it his handful of, just a handful of fine flour with oil and the frankincense so it smells good. And the priest shall burn it as memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And the rest of the grain offering, Leviticus 2, 3, shall be Aaron's and his sons. They can eat it. It's the most holy thing of offerings to the Lord made by fire. But if, if it's the day you've been anointed and you've been consecrated, you can't eat any of it. The whole thing has to be burned because it's just symbolic that this is somebody who's com committing their entire life, right? Uh, which is why a lot of the priests in the old days, uh, Catholic priests, etc., you know, you went off and lived in a monastery. You went off and lived because you were saying, I'm dedicating... 24 hours a day to God. Okay, so it's that that was their attempt to duplicate this sort of feeling. I'm not saying that that's the thing that everyone must do who's a minister, but you got to feel like you belong wholly to the Lord. However, that is expressed in your life if you're a minister. Third law of the law, the sin offering. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 24. Uh, also, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. Law of the burnt offering, law of the grain offering, law of the sin offering. Three laws. Fire's got to keep going all the time. It's got to be holy. The person who touches has to be holy. Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, the sin offering shall be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. So there's a special place where they killed the burnt offering, the sin offering has to be killed in that place. Verse 26, and the priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of meeting. This is just a general sin offering. Just a general sin offering, not the one on the day of atonement. Just somebody saying, oh, I farted in church. Here's my sin offering. Whatever, right? You, you're recognizing a specific sin. Verse 26, the priest who offers it for sin shall eat it in the place, and the whole place it shall be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of meeting. I just read that. Leviticus 6, 27. Everyone who touches its flesh, though, must be holy. And when its blood is sprinkled on any garment, if the blood gets on the garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place because the blood of the sin offering is sinful and is damaging that garment and it must be white as so. When, so when, when sin soaks into something, there's no way it can be cleansed. It, uh, uh, when the sin soaks in, you, you know, you've got, that article has been damaged. You've got to wash it in a holy place. You've got to do a whole special thing. Interestingly, the blood, when it touches the metal, they didn't have to go and destroy the metal or do something to it because the metal has already been through the fire and that's how it got its shape. So in a sense, uh, it's already been judged. It's already gone through the fire. But if sin, if the blood got on other things, then there's a special way it had to be dealt with which is coming up, so I don't want to get everything confused. But uh, Leviticus 6, chapter 30, but no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned in the fire. So no, any sin offering from which, this is Leviticus 6, 30, from which 
the blood is brought into the tabernacle meeting. So the, the, there are certain sin offerings where you, you take it, you kill it, and then that blood is brought into the tabernacle of meeting and the cleansing takes its place and, and you sprinkled on the altar that's inside the tent. And on that sin offering, you can't eat that. It's got to be burned totally in the, holy, in the fire. Now, what do we do with it later? It's going to eventually, the ashes are going to be eventually be taken out of the camp. And this is law three. The ashes of the burnt offering must leave. So what's law one? Uh, the fire must be continual. That's a sign of our continual relation with God. This, you must be consecrated if you are handling the holy things of the Lord. And these ashes have to be carried outside the camp. In Leviticus 16, 27, it says the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, depending on what you use, whose blood was brought in to make atonement. If that's what you do with the sin offering. The blood's been brought in, in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Those ashes, all that has to be carried outside the camp, and they shall burn it in the, in the fire, their skins, their flesh, the whole thing got to be burned, right? Because outside the camp, why? What's the image that he's trying to give to them over and over and over? So when the real shows up, when Jesus shows up, they'll go, oh, I understand what that was. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11, the author of Hebrews explains this. He says, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary, so sometimes that didn't happen, but if the, if the blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, they're burned outside the camp, and the ashes are taken outside the camp. It says, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate of the temple. He's talking about uh, the gate of the city, right? The temple wall is, is right uh, the, uh, next to the wall, it's the wall of the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus was taken outside. The, now the temple, um, the, the hill right outside was Calvary. And so whenever they would take the sin offering, ever since David in the year 1000 built the temple there, they'd also take the sin offering and had to be burned outside the camp and the ashes taken outside the camp for that the big sin offering, the Day of Atonement sin offering, that sin offering happen outside the camp. So there's sin offerings that happen once a year and then there's sin offering that happen every day. But the big sin offering, when that blood was sprinkled inside, it had to be taken outside the camp, burned outside the camp. And it was taken to Calvary and that's where it was burned. He said just that same way Jesus was taken outside the camp, taken outside the gate, outside the city that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. That's Hebrews 13, 12. So he's taking all the sin upon him and he's removing it from the camp so that we can now be righteous. So he's taking all the sin on him. He's becoming the offering for the sin. And it's moved outside the camp. So he says, I need you to do that Whenever it's this type of sin offering, take it outside the camp so that you know that all that that is tainted is removed and now I have this fresh relationship with God. Do it every time so that you don't wonder, is God mad at me? Is our relationship cool? Once you've laid your hands on that sin offering and in your mind, that is you now. And instead of you having to go through the fire, it's the offering for your sin. It's the penalty for your sin. Uh, but it's like paying a fine. The fine doesn't, like, if you, um, oh, I was speeding, I had to pay this ticket. That's the price that has to be paid. The money you paid does not become your sin. It's the offering for the sin. It's the price. Jesus didn't become sin. He was the offering for it. But it's got to be taken away from you. Okay, and now the price is paid. I'm free of that penalty. So it's got to be taken outside the camp. In verse 13 of Hebrews 13, it says, Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, 
Now, the book of Hebrews is written to Hebrews. It's not a secret. In Jerusalem, they were considering going back and starting all the sacrifices again because they were under too much pressure by the non-believing Jews. The Jews that believed were like, maybe we should go back. And he's like, no, Jesus did this. All of these offerings, they all represented what Jesus was going to do. And he's done it. So let's go with him, bearing our reproach. You know, we let's go to where Jesus was outside the camp and see our sin taken care of in that way. Let's go with him, not with these priests who are going to take our sin outside the camp. Let's go with Jesus. And then it says, verse 15, therefore of Hebrews 13, by him, by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Those first three offerings are our sacrifice of praise to God. And it's continual. It's continuous. It's just like that fire was burning all the time, just like that it was day and night. Now the offering, we don't have to burn an animal to show our repentance. We don't have to kill an animal to show how grateful we are. Now we can say it with our mouths. We, we give the offering of praise, a sacrifice of praise. We, we, we give up our time and our words to him to show him that we love him. And that should be a continual thing. So just like that burnt offering, that fire is supposed to go all the time. We're always supposed to be talking to God, thanking and praising him for what he's done. Those first three offerings are just our thanks. If there's a specific sin, then we bring that to God. And in our minds, our sin is carried outside the gate where Jesus went uh, and taken care of so that we can feel free. The price is paid. So these offerings are to teach them about God, teach them about their relationship with Jesus. That's coming. To teach them what the Messiah is going to do. What happened is there were other things the Messiah was going to do and they forgot about the sacrifice. They started focusing on, and he will vanquish your enemies. And so when Jesus was finally there, they were so focused on, you're going to vanquish our enemy. You're the Messiah. You're supposed to vanquish our enemy. But they forgot all of this sacrifice stuff. No, I'm the Messiah. I'm The first thing that was established was the sacrifice. And through the sacrifice, your enemy will be vanquished. But all this that I'm setting up in Leviticus that you're supposed to learn, that's in order to rectify your relationship with God. All of this is happening so that you can have a right relationship with God. So we don't neglect the sacrifice, but they did. So when Jesus came and was ready to sacrifice, they were so unclear, like, what are you doing? Because they just felt like the sacrifice was not important, not a big deal. Yeah, we just do it as just routine, just tradition. Yeah, but here's the important stuff over here. And we always decide what is most important for God. As a culture today, we've decided this is what God is most upset about and he's going to take care of this and he's going to take he's going to vanquish those people who are and and, and we're just like the, the Jews when Jesus showed up he's going to vanquish the Romans because he's so upset about that and like I promise you I'm more upset about your relationship with me than I am mad at the Romans the sacrifice is the most important thing if I can change your hearts if I can get you to continually burn a fire in your heart for me all that other stuff will be taken care of but if we neglect this, like that's not important, and we're focusing on this other stuff, we're going to miss Jesus. So uh, anyway, so the author of Hebrews is trying to get them back. This, like, don't miss what the sacrifice was for. Uh, which, and it's too bad that Leviticus is hard to read. Um, but I'm glad to go through it because all of this is important. Uh, that's why it's the third book in the Bible. It's important. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for listening in. I am reminding you that uh, that next Sunday, again, uh, there's a concert at 3 o'clock. That'll be, it's at my church. We'd love for you to come. But also, if you want to watch it on online, on the Facebook page or on YouTube or uh, on our website, you're welcome to do that. Okay. So thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, I'll see some of you on Wednesday where we are in the book of Luke, and others of you, I'll see you next Sunday. All right. Bye-bye.